I've got another story for you, and this one's a good one. Hey everybody, it's Garth Weber. It's uh, June 22nd, Monday, beautiful day here in Berkeley, warm, clear, no wind. Uh, we're all still locked down here, it's the pandemic. Uh, anyway, my story today is about Tommy Bolin, a very important character in my musical life. Um, I grew up from the age of 10 till I was 22 in Boulder, Colorado. And when I was about 14 or 15, there was this band called Zephyr. And they were the coolest band ever to me at the time. And they're, they're still cool. Uh, they were a, kind of what we, I thought of them as an underground rock band, you know. Um, they were really aggressive. They had a, a female singer who was very much influenced by Janis Joplin, I think. And just a good band. Um, so anyway, the guitar player was Tommy Bolin. He was an extremely charismatic person. He had the look, he had the style, he knew how to dress. He was way ahead of the curve in terms of, of um, uh, being edgy. Like This is in 1971, or, well, this is actually earlier than that. Uh, and he was already dyeing his hair like streaks of purple in his hair and you know long hair down to the bottom of his pockets about the same length as mine was at the time uh, and but he would dye it all these different colors and stuff and he wore these um, you know four inch platform shoes and velvet bell bottoms and I mean he was just you know kind of like Prince or Hendrix or these people who just have a natural flair so uh, so I was aware of the band. I only got to see them a couple times. In fact, I nearly jumped out of a, a moving car because we were driving along uh, next to cent what we called Central Park in Boulder, uh, and there they were playing. And I just about jumped out of the back of this car I was riding in. <laughs> so I was excited about these guys. Well, so a few years later, this would have been uh, probably 1971 or 72, I would have been a junior in high school, and uh, I got a phone call, and it was Tommy Bolin. Now, Tommy had a voice, a unique voice, uh, a little bit like um, Jack Nicholson. So I hear this f voice on the other end of the phone, and he goes, Hey, Garth, I hear you got a place where we could practice. And I'm like, Who is this? I'm getting punked here. And, but sure enough, it was Tommy. And I lived on a farm, and we had a, a, a big dairy barn, a barn about 40 feet long, uh, 20 feet wide, I guess, and where my friends and I hung out, I had my man cave in a small room there, and we rehearsed our band there. And so Tommy said, you know, we want to rehearse in your place. And I was thinking, this is like mana, mana from heaven. And so uh, he said, you know, how much do you need? And I thought, I don't know, I would do it, I've done it for free. And he said, well, how about, you know, how about $15 a month, Garth? And I was like, great. So the band shows up, and it consisted of a local drummer named Bobby Burge, very good drummer, a uh, bass player named Stan Sheldon, who later went on to play with, um, with uh, Peter Frampton. I believe he still does play with Peter Frampton. I talked to him a few years ago. I almost went to a Peter Frampton show. But anyway, uh, and then a keyboard player named Tom Stevenson, who had a B3 organ, and he may have had some other keyboards, I don't remember. Uh, he later went on to play with Gary Wright, um, Dreamweaver guy. So, and then occasionally a singer might show up. It was usually a guy named Jeff Cook. If Jeff was in town from New York, he might come and jam with the band. So the band rehearsed for three months in my in my dairy barn, and of course I wanted as much of this as I could possibly get. So, so I would uh, I would be in my room, my little little side room, and then they would be out in the main room, which is about 30 feet long by 20 feet wide, uh, and I would listen through the door. Well, now, I was a drummer at this point. I hadn't switched to guitar yet. That didn't happen for a couple, for, well, until that year, actually. And so uh, one day, they were rehearsing, and I got on my drums, and I started jamming with them. And then they stopped, and the door opened, and, and it was Tommy, and he said, hey, Garth, you can't play with us, man. You're messing us up. I, oh, okay, sorry. So I looked around the room and I had a guitar. So I picked up my electric guitar and I didn't plug it in and just started j jamming with them. And essentially that is when I began to change lanes into a, a guitar player. Uh, I 
kind of had been doing both a little bit, but I still would have been considered myself more of a drummer than a guitar player. So we, so then I began going in and listening to them, you know, sitting five, ten feet from Tommy, who was playing a, a, a Stratocaster through a Marshall stack at full volume, a hundred watt Marshall blasting, and I'm sitting right in front of it, just loving life. Uh, and they were so good. They were a fusion band. This is back when fusion was just starting out. And uh, the, uh, the songs were instrumentals. Some of them were in odd time signatures. Some of them were, uh, well, some of them were vocal tunes, but not very many. And so, uh, and a, a few funny things happened. Like one day, we had goats <laughs> on the farm, and a goat got in the rehearsal room. And of course, it freaked out. And so here was this scene of Tommy Bolin in these green velvet bell bottoms with his, with his puffy shirt running around the, the room with a drumstick trying to hit this goat who was knocking things over. He knocked a cymbal stand over. I think he almost knocked an amp over. And then the, the later, that goat, maybe not the same one, got on top of a van that they had brought over, and we, they couldn't get it off the top of the van. And, and they, one guy went up on top of the van to knock the goat off, and the goat knocked him off. And so he, uh, so they had to get in the van, drive it forward, hit the brakes, and then the goat went buck, 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 down the front of the van, as if to say, I was going to get off anyway, you know. So they rehearsed for the summer, and I began to ask Tommy questions about uh, guitar playing. So I would wait till the end of the rehearsal, and he was so nice about it. I did, in retrospect, I didn't realize how generous he was being with his time, but he was. And so he would say, you know, I'd say, what was that chord you played? And he'd show me the exact fingering in the chord. And, and, of course, I was picking up a lot just by him leading the band and explaining, you know, listen, guys, here's the riff, you know. And then he'd play the riff, and they'd get it wrong. And he'd say, no, no, listen to the... So I began to observe what it was to be a good band leader at that point. And he really was a good band leader. And he was just a, a massively good player. And for anybody who knows what an echoplex is, he it's a, it's a, it was a tape effect unit, a little tiny tape recorder essentially that would record the sound and then play it back shortly thereafter to make an echo sound. And Tommy got more out of an echoplex than anybody before or since as far as I'm concerned. He really knew how to maximize the effect of this, of this device. So uh, eventually I just changed lanes. I became a guitar player. And uh, it was time for our, uh, I, I don't know if it was prom or uh, you know, the big, big dance of the year at, at my high school. And I convinced uh, student council, I was on the student council, and I convinced the school to hire Tommy Boland's band to play at prom. Now, this was a, a monumental mistake because these guys played instrumental music that no one in that school would have ever heard before. And I, I, I'm surprised that I didn't get called on the carpet for this. But the band played at prom. They played all these weird songs. You know, it's, one song was like in 11-8 or something. And, you know, high school kids are trying to dance to this. They're trying to enjoy the prom. And uh, then, so that, that was my experience with Tommy. And then Tommy went on to play with a drummer named Billy Cobham, a, uh, an extraordinarily world-class drummer to this day. And they did an album called Spectrum. Uh, and I just found out that bass player Lee Sklar he, he, Lee Sklar looks like uh, he's got um, a massive white beard down to his base, and, and he's bald, and he has, you know, long hair in the back. He's played on uh, thousands of albums, I'm sure, uh, with everybody from James Taylor to, to Billy Cobham. And so he was the bass player on this album, Spectrum, which I still love. Um, so uh, Tommy uh, started a solo career. He released a couple of solo albums. And wanted to, to flash back for a minute, one of the things that, about Tommy was he wanted to be high all the time. And one time he was about to go into the house, my house, to use the bathroom, and he said, Hey, Garth, if I find something in the medicine cabinet, can I eat it? And I was like, Sure, man, go ahead, you know. And so, so he said to me, he said one time, I want to die young and leave a good-looking corpse. And that's exactly what happened, unfortunately. At the age of 25, he, was, he and his band were opening for Jeff Beck. I think it was in, was in Florida for sure. I don't, it might have been Miami. And he overdosed, and he died. Uh, and so it was very sad because he had so much potential, I would have loved to have seen what he would have done had he, had he lived, because he was 
in that level of creativity along with Hendrix and, and the best guitar players of the day. So um, there's my Tommy Boland story. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll talk to you guys later.